This is a container into which my housemate put food scraps, especially the skin of a cantaloupe. Unfortunately, even though this container has a lid, it wasn't sealed tightly, as a result of which fruit flies were able to enter. This is bad because rotting food, especially fruit, leads to the birth of large numbers of fruit flies, many of which will experience intense suffering when they die, just a few days or weeks after birth. These fruit flies may have decent lives, especially indoors where they aren't faced with predators, but they live at most a month or two and will die gruesomely one way or another. Fruit flies indoors might be accidentally killed by people, especially if they're in a garbage can or other container in which they might be crushed. And since food supplies are finite, an explosive fruit fly population boom will eventually end in mass death. To prevent this tragedy from getting started, I recommend sealing all food scraps in airtight containers, such as this, or at least in an airtight bag that you can tie shut like this. That way the food waste will be eaten by fungi and bacteria, which I care about less per unit of metabolism than I care about insects like fruit flies which are surprisingly intelligent creatures. Fruit flies can also accumulate in trash bins. If these flies don't die of natural causes, they're likely to be crushed when you put more trash in the trash bin, when the trash bag is thrown in a garbage truck, or by a landfill compactor. In my experience, fruit fly accumulation in a garbage can usually happens when there's food or moisture in the garbage. So I wash all food scraps and crumbs off packaging or other trash and then let it dry out before throwing it in the trash. That way the garbage can will only have clean, dry materials which are less likely to attract flies. For good measure I also cover the garbage can. If you have a lot of food waste, I recommend sealing it in an airtight bag or other insect-proof container, as mentioned before. Of course, if fruit flies have already laid eggs in food waste, there's still a chance that they'll develop even in a sealed container. But at least the chances of fruit fly infestation of the food scraps can be dramatically reduced. Fortunately, the theory of spontaneous generation is false. People sometimes use insecticides to kill adult fruit flies, but this is obviously painful to those killed. Instead, I recommend focusing on prevention. This article says, quote, unless the breeding sites are removed or cleaned, the problem will continue no matter how often insecticides are applied to control the adults, end quote. I recommend putting food in the fridge or at least having it in sealed plastic containers or plastic bags. I try to contain not just fruit and vegetables but also bread because I've seen that fruit flies may like bread as well. The article also explains how one can construct a trap to catch fruit flies in a jar and then release them outside. However, I'm worried about the use of traps based on watching some YouTube videos about the process. This video shows how to trap fruit flies using cider vinegar. Unfortunately, the fruit flies drown, which is probably painful. Another video shows trapping of fruit flies with a lemon, but then the fruit flies are microwaved alive, which is probably extremely painful given that insects are averse to excessive heat. In this video, the fruit is left inside the trap and the fruit flies are left to die in the trap since they can't easily get out. This doesn't involve killing the flies directly, but the problem with this approach is that it provides food to the fruit flies, allowing for more flies to be born involuntarily into short lives. In a follow-up to the initial video here, you can see huge numbers of fruit flies in the bowl. I wonder if some of these were born in the bowl or if all of them came in from outside. In theory, you could trap fruit flies on a piece of fruit, 
take that piece of fruit outside and blow the fruit flies off the fruit and then bring the fruit back inside and seal it in a container to decompose anaerobically. However, this is pretty labor intensive and you might crush some fruit flies in the process. Another possibility could be to freeze the lemon or banana slice that's used to trap the flies. If you do this, it's probably best to put the trap in the freezer within a day or two of setting it out to prevent lots of flies from breeding in it. I would leave the flies in the freezer as long as possible to make sure they're actually dead, at least for several days if not weeks or months. It's unknown whether freezing is humane for insects, although even if it's not humane, it's probably a better death than, for example, heating to death in a microwave. I tend to just hide away food sources in my house and let the fruit flies starve due to no longer having food. I don't know how painful starvation is for insects. In humans, starvation may be one of the more humane ways to die, in some cases at least but it's not clear how this finding translates to insects. In any case, if you keep food from rotting in the open and wash bags, containers, and dishes after using them, you may not have many fruit flies in your house, in which case you won't have to worry about fruit fly removal methods. I filmed this video on 5 August 2016 near Albany, New York, USA. After this incident, I recommended that my housemate use a sealed plastic container for food waste next time. Here's a random fly that landed on the lid of the container. However, in the rest of this video, I'll show just fruit flies and their larvae, which were the main denizens of the decaying food scraps. I'm uncertain exactly what kind of fruit flies these are. Based on bugguide.net, I'm pretty certain they're in the family Drosophilidae, and they might even be in the genus Drosophila, but I'm not sure. This page reports that, quote, several Drosophila species, including D. melanogaster, D. immigrans, and D. simulans, are closely associated with humans and are often referred to as domestic species." End quote. In the rest of this video, I'll read some general information about Drosophila, especially Drosophila melanogaster, which is among the most famous model organisms used in science. However, even if the particular flies in this video aren't Drosophila, they're probably closely related enough that much of the same information also applies to them. This article on the Drosophilidae family says, quote, This fruit fly is mostly composed of post-mitotic cells, has a very short lifespan, and shows gradual aging. As in other species, temperature influences the life history of the animal. End quote. This article on the Drosophila genus says, quote, Drosophila species are found all around the world, with more species in the tropical regions. Most species breed in various kinds of decaying plant and fungal material, including fruit, bark, slime fluxes, flowers, and mushrooms. Males may congregate at patches of suitable breeding substrate to compete for the females, or form lex, that's spelled L-E-K-S, conducting courtship in an area separate from breeding sites. Males of this genus are known to have the longest sperm cells of any studied organism on Earth, including one species, Drosophila bifurca, that has a sperm 58 millimeters long. D. melanogaster sperm cells are a more modest 1.8 millimeters long, although this is still about 35 times longer than a human sperm. Several species in the D. melanogaster species group are known to mate by traumatic insemination. Drosophila species vary widely in their reproductive capacity. Those such as D. melanogaster that breed in large, relatively rare resources have ovaries that mature 10 to 20 eggs at a time, so that they can be laid together on one site. 
Others that breed in more abundant but less nutritious substrates, such as leaves, may only lay one egg per day. Larvae feed not on the vegetable matter itself, but on the yeasts and microorganisms present on the decaying breeding substrate. Development time varies widely between species, between 7 and more than 60 days, and depends on the environmental factors, such as temperature, breeding substrate, and crowding. Median lifespan is 35 to 45 days. Like other metazoans, Drosophila is associated with various bacteria in its gut. The fly gut microbiota, or microbiome, seems to have a central influence on Drosophila fitness and life history characteristics. The microbiota in the gut of Drosophila represents an active current research field. Drosophila species are prey for many generalist predators, such as robber flies. In Hawaii, the introduction of yellow jackets from the mainland United States has led to the decline of many of the large species. The larvae are preyed on by other fly larvae, staphylinid beetles, and ants. End quote. This page explains, quote, The fruit fly's life cycle begins when the female lays her eggs on a piece of fermenting fruit or other decaying sweet organic material. She can lay up to 500 eggs, making it difficult to control the population. After eggs hatch into small, white larvae, they eat from their nesting site for four days, absorbing the nutrients and energy needed to transform into adults. End quote. An enormous amount of research has been done on Drosophila learning. This article says, quote, we studied the behavioral consequences of traumatic, painful experiences. These consequences were fundamentally asymmetric. Fruit flies, Drosophila melanogaster, learn two kinds of prediction regarding a traumatic experience. If an odor preceded an electric shock during training, it predicted shock, and flies subsequently avoided it. When the sequence of events during training was reversed, that is, odor followed shock. The odor predicted relief from shock, and flies approached it. We called this latter effect relief learning, and showed that, in terms of psychological mechanisms, it established genuinely associative, conditioned approach behavior. Parametric analyses showed that relief learning was reproducible across experimenters. It did not depend on the fly's gender, and reached asymptotic levels after six training trials. These analyses may further our understanding of the psychological mechanisms underlying behavioral changes after a traumatic experience." End quote. This review article summarizes many learning experiments that have been done on fruit flies. I thought it was such a good article that I wanted to briefly summarize most of its sections. Section 1, Olfactory Avoidance Learning. The article explains a setup in which flies are trained to associate one odor with electric shock and another odor with absence of shock, after which the flies tended more often to go toward the odor not associated with shock. Section 2, Olfactory Aversive Conditioning. This involves a binary T-maze setup. Again, the fruit flies are trained to avoid an odor paired with electric shock and seek one not paired with shock. The article says, quote, A single training session does not form persistent memory in this paradigm, and performance is essentially absent 24 hours after training. However, 6 to 10 training sessions with or without rest intervals forms memory that lasts for days. End quote. Section 3, Olfactory Appetitive Conditioning. Fruit flies learn to associate an odor with a sucrose reward. The paper notes that, quote, flies have to be hungry to learn and retrieve memory efficiently in the sugar-rewarded paradigm, end quote. Section 4, Olfactory Conditioning of the Proboscis Extension Reflex. 
fruit flies were trained to extend their proboscises in the presence of an odor that had previously been associated with sucrose. Also, quote, Drosophila can be conditioned to inhibit the proboscis extension reflex if the bitter tastent quinine is presented in the sugar and can also be trained to withdraw their proboscis in response to electric shock, end quote. Section 5, Visual Learning in the Flight Simulator. This picture illustrates the remarkable setup of a fruit fly flight simulator. Quote, flies can be trained to avoid a particular landmark by punishing the fly when it approaches that pattern, either with heat or with a plume of an aversive odor, such as benzaldehyde. A different, safe, unpunished landmark is also presented. During the memory test phase, the fly is given several minutes to display preference for one of the visual cues, and trained flies selectively avoid the conditioned landmark. Memory in these two paradigms lasts for about 20 minutes, but can be lengthened by repetitive training." End quote. Section 6, Motor Learning in the Flight Simulator. In the flight simulator, quote, the fly can be conditioned to avoid turning yawing right or left by punishing it with heat when it torques in that particular direction." End quote. Skipping to section 8, heat box. A walking fruit fly can learn to avoid one half of a chamber based on heat punishments. Quote, Since the flies are trained and tested in darkness, the memory formed is believed to result from the integration of tactile information and path length slash body orientation, end quote. Section 9, Winner or Loser Mentality. This section describes how male flies who fight with each other seem to remember which other flies they fought in the past. Quote, Opponents who previously fought each other spent less time fighting when repaired than flies that were paired with unfamiliar opponents, suggesting that they remembered their opponents and had no desire to reinitiate their previous brawl." End quote. Section 10, Courtship Conditioning. Quote, when a sexually naive male is placed with a recently mated female in a small chamber, his courtship vigor rapidly declines with continued exposure to and rejection by the female. If the trained male is then paired with a virgin female, normally an object of vigorous courtship, he courts her far less than a control male that was not trained. End quote. Section 11, Aversive Phototaxic Suppression. This paradigm looks at a trade-off between two motivations. Ordinarily, fruit flies prefer to seek light, but their light-seeking can be inhibited, though not completely eliminated, by pairing light with quinine or humidity. The next sections are about learning in larvae. Section 12, olfactory conditioning in larvae. Quote, Drosophila larvae possess 21 pairs of olfactory sensory neurons, 80 pairs of gustatory sensory neurons, and only 12 neurons for vision. The adult fly, in comparison, has approximately 1,300, 650, and 6,000, respectively. End quote. Despite this, larvae, like adults, are capable of impressive feats of learning. For instance, like adults, larvae can also learn to avoid an odor that was paired with an electric shock. Section 13, Olfactory Conditioning with Gustatory Reinforcement in Larvae. Larvae prefer an odor previously paired with fructose over an odor previously paired with quinine or salt. Section 14, Visual Learning in Larvae. While adult fruit flies seek light, larvae seek darkness. However, this preference can be reduced if light is paired with a reward and dark is paired with a punishment. Finally, the article concludes by arguing that invertebrate brains are more interesting than is sometimes assumed. Quote, in this review, we hope to have at least conveyed the message that fruit fly behavior is complex and plastic." End quote. 
there are endless further studies on fruit fly brains and behavior. Here's one more interesting article, from which I'll read a few snippets. Quote, Chemosensory systems detect structurally diverse molecules and translate them into tastes and smells. In Drosophila, a family of 68 gustatory receptor genes mediates taste detection. These genes are expressed in subsets of gustatory neurons, and their expression patterns provide insight into the logic of taste recognition. In this study, we find that taste receptors are expressed in overlapping cell populations, such that taste cells can be categorized into two different groups based on the receptors they express. One large population of taste neurons can be defined by the GR66A promoter. Our two-color labeling studies directly demonstrate that multiple receptors are co-expressed in GR66A positive cells. A second population expresses the GR5A receptor. These different populations recognize different taste categories. GR5A cells mediate sweet detection, and GR66A cells mediate bitter detection. The patterns of Drosophila taste receptor expression resemble those of the mammalian taste system and the C. elegans chemosensory system where multiple receptors are also expressed per cell. In the mammalian taste system, multiple bitter receptors are co-expressed in one population of cells on the tongue, whereas receptors for sugars are expressed in a different population of taste cells, arguing that different sensory cells recognize different taste modalities. Remarkably, the concept of distinct sweet and bitter cells also applies to the fly. Our behavioral studies reveal that GR5A cells recognize sugars and mediate acceptance attractive behaviors, whereas GR66A cells recognize bitter compounds and mediate avoidance. Notably, GR5A cells are also required to recognize low concentrations of salt, but not high concentrations. Interestingly, low salt is palatable to flies and mammals and mediates attractive behaviors. In contrast, high concentrations of salt elicit aversive behaviors. Thus, we speculate that GR5A cells contain receptors that recognize attractive tastes, low salt, and sugars. This suggests that GR5A cells may be acceptance cells rather than sweet cells. In the visual system and somatosensory system, a sensory neuron's projections are defined by the neuron's position in the periphery. In contrast, in the olfactory system, a neuron's projections are organized based on the receptor it expresses. Our anatomical and behavioral studies suggest that in the gustatory system of the fruit fly, sensory neurons map both the position and the quality of a taste. Overall, our studies demonstrate that the logic of gustatory projections is very different from olfactory projections in the fly. The gustatory system appears to have a very simple map of different taste organs, proboscis, mouth parts, leg, and different taste categories, sugars, bitter compounds, whereas the olfactory system has a map of 50 different odorant receptors. The fly uses its olfactory system to recognize and distinguish thousands of odors, and the segregation of olfactory inputs suggests that different odors can be distinguished by different patterns of brain activity. The fly uses its taste system to locate food and to decide whether or not to eat it, and taste projections are segregated by peripheral position and taste category. The gustatory map suggests that the fly needs to know the location and the quality of a taste, but may not need to finally distinguish many different cues." End quote. Mm -hmm.